What opportunities or synergies are there for DevOps in the networking space, and what does that look like? Ah, it's funny you should ask. So about a year ago, so if most people know me, I, I've been involved in kind of DevOps. You know, the movement is five years old, you know, by definition. We're actually having our five-year anniversary in Ghent. Um, but I, you know, I've been doing this probably eight or ten years. I've been an ops guy for 35 years. But the last ten years have been interesting, starting out with kind of working with Puppet Labs and, and Luke Kinnis, and then I was an early in in ops code. And, and, and last summer I, I, I went through um, an exit with a company, and I was really trying to think out what's next. You know, I think almost like computer's done, right? <laughs> like we've, we've, the memo's out, not everybody's doing it, but compute is from a memo standpoint solved. And I ran into some of these network people, specifically on the Open Daylight project, and I, I really got an uh, insight to what they were trying to solve. And then SDN, the real SDN story, you know, software-defined networking. And, and what intrigued me was the whole, uh, they talk about this underlay and overlay, right? And overlay is, is from an SDN perspective, things like, building tunnels and building um, you know, things like VXLAN and stuff like that. And the underlay is like the fun stuff, right? That's what I've lived my whole life is in the underlay. So like what is the switch and how does it relate to all this software-based stuff? So I, I really have been on a year-long exploration of trying to figure out what does DevOps mean, particularly very interested in the underlay part of it. And what that means is things like just the ugly stuff, like how do you do network configuration? Like we've done a really good job in kind of what we call infrastructure as code for how to harden a, an operating system, how to s install middleware, how to build applications, things like Chef, Puppet, Ansible, right? have been inc incredibly uh, interesting, well-defined projects for doing that. But the question now becomes like how do you configure a network switch, right? And where do you, how do you, and not just like, how, so how do we start applying those abstraction layers that we did for compute? Well, you build abstraction. We, we, now that we have abstraction, we can store that in a source control. Now that we have it in source control, we can actually treat this like a software artifact. So we move from a, a state of, and, 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 interestingly enough, 10 years ago, sysadmins were using spreadsheets to configure systems. You know, maybe it was a checklist. And today, most network administrators are using spreadsheets and checklists to configure. We moved away from that in compute, which have Pup and Ansible. Um, so this, this opportunity starts with this idea of, like instead of me just pulling a, a spreadsheet and hard wiring stuff in a network config, I treat it as a software artifact, I store it in Git, I pull it down, I collaborate, I create a pull request for the change, the change now goes into a continuous integration flow, the continuous integration flow turns into a test driven development, we actually do some simulation for the behavior driven, so we start treating the network just like we're doing system. And what's interesting, in some cases, there's people already, there are companies already doing this. In a lot of cases, people, minds are blown. When you go network person, they think, oh yeah, of course that makes sense. And so that's kind of the beginning of the journey of the opportunity. And I think as we start talking about software to find everything or software to find data center, we start finding that like doing this, this form of abstraction and continuous delivery flow and treating um, typical operations as a software endeavor becomes the secret sauce and, and we, we have been neglecting the network um, in, in, our, in our kind of tenured DevOps journey. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. In, uh, in some recent talks about bringing DevOps to the network, you've introduced a couple of characters, Bill and Bob. Yeah, so who, who are they and why are they important to the story? So, you know, I apologize to all the Bobs, uh, the listeners, but Bob seems to be one of my favorite characters and for years, whenever I want to talk about something messy in IT, I pull out my Bob. And, and so the Bob in, in compute, right, was, was Bob, you know, Bob had Bob's directories and Bob's, you know, I, I also say, uh, this is a joke that sometimes people get or not, if, Bob, if digital properties could have coffee stains, Bob's, like, scripts would have coffee stains, right? Like, Bob's directory, and I would say, like, if Bob dies, we're in big trouble. And, and so the question was like 10 years, eight years ago when I was trying to evangelize things like Puppet and then openly Chef, you go to the Bob and you say, Bob, you know, I've got this idea and it's, it's going to change the way you do things and it's an abstraction layer. And, you know, and the first thing Bob would do is say, yeah, I don't trust that. You know, like it, it's going to wake up in the middle of the night and just do weird things. And I'm like, no, no, Bob, it, it, uh, trust me. I mean, you may make a finger check and put 1,000 instead of 100 and like I'm not saying we can eliminate that but I can certainly guarantee you it's not going to wake up in the middle of the night just decide to destroy machines, right? And then you get past that, and then you say, then Bob's like, well, you don't understand my infrastructure. 
like, wow, you know, that's my sequel, it's Memcache. You know, like, yeah, it's it's cool, but it really isn't special. And then only you keep drilling down and, and just defeating. A lot of times you'd have to come back to Bob, you know, the second time, the third time. And then, you know, ultimately, you know, there was this also, the, the real capstone was, the, um, it was ultimately changing to a fear model. Like, okay, like you got me on everything, John, but this system can never, ever, ever, ever go down. And then, you know, like the world is changing. We have things like Chaos Monkey and, and Anti-Fragile from Nasa Talam and all that, right? So we, we get this, right? That like, yes, that's a hard one to swallow. But, but ultimately, Bob was afraid of control, losing control, right? Like that's just... So a year ago, I started doing this discovery with the network folk, right? And it was eerie. It was like I hit the rewind button. And the only difference was my new archetype is Bill, right? Just, and Bill basically uh, very much same like, yeah, you know, I don't trust this thing. I use network switches. They got fig on there. Really, you know, you can't screw them up. And worry about it. It's not going to basically, you know, just change things automatically in the middle of the night. And then you go through the second piece of, you know, getting Bob to understand that, that you know, his stuff really isn't special. Like their network of figs and like there's a there's gazillion people running a, a a 6500 Cisco switch or, you know, um, in the wrist of switches. And then, you know, and you drill down and, and then, now, the, now I will, uh, it, it's not true. The, the, the fear of failure or, or accepting failure as an operating domain is a much harder hurdle in the network space than it is in system. Because, because, you know, Bill is right. A bad configuration on a router protocol that distributes within seconds could be disastrous. But, but even when they, they lay down the gauntlet to me about, like, you don't understand the network, you know, your server can go down and it won't cause any, and I, I explained to him the night capital story, right? Like, like bad hygiene is bad hygiene. You know, abstraction and these things, these principles work well. And, and so don't tell me that one failure domain is more important than another failure domain when, when I can tell you that, you know, a, a high frequency trading company that went out of business in 24 hours and lost 300, 400 million in three hours, and that wasn't a network problem, right? So, but ultimately it's the same problem, right? Bill is afraid of control. Right, so that, that's my comparison. You know, I think you know, I, I play the, I know how the movie ends, but I don't know how the scenes are gonna play out in this network. You know, and again, I, we've seen a great pattern over the last 10 years in compute, and, and I, I'm pretty sure I know how it ends. It's just gonna play out a little bit differently for Bill versus Bob. <laughs> and what other similarities are you finding between bringing DevOps to IT and bringing it to the network? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the, uh, you know, it's the changing mindset. So there's a couple of things, right? There were some convergent points. Like, so early days of compute when you went into people, I mean, you got a lot of resistance. It was change. It was, and, and like one of the things that you would hear a lot like eight, nine years ago was, well, John, that all makes sense, this abstraction, this thing like Chef or Puppet, putting a DSL around, you know, making what I do as a language. Um, that all is great, but, um, but I only ch change the server once, right? Like, and now we know that's like silly, right? Like when I say that in a presentation, everybody laughs. Well, you'd be surprised how many people, when I talk in network space, big, large enterprises will say the same thing about Switch. Well, we only change it once. We hardly ever change it. I'm like that's not the new world. You know, there's um, we used to say there is the throw the server out the sixth floor test with DevOps. You know, is it stateful? Is it stateless? Right? You know, can we throw it out the sixth floor and can we rebuild it back to the state that it was? Right? Well, there are customers that I've been working with that are doing these for switches. You know, switches, you run these leaf supply networks is one of the models you can do. Like one of the leafs, basically, you can do a field replacement and you could basically, you know, replace it. So, you know, the, there I say there's the throw the switch out the sixth floor test is a viable operating model now for some large, at least greenfield-like networks that run things like the new Cisco devices, 9K or Arista, these things. That, um, so, so I think that the there similarities of the, the resistance of how we think and we know how it changes. I think there's also, so that some of the conversion points for the original Bob were like cloud. Like so, like Bob could stay there and be the, like it takes three weeks or eight weeks to do what Bob does for any one given implementation. But when then all of a sudden that, that kind of pipeline turned from weeks into minutes, where Bob's role might have been three days in an eight week pro, you know, checklist build, now it was three days at an eight minute pipeline. It was not tolerable. So we're seeing the same thing in the network space. We, like SDN is a reality. Software-defined networks are basically changing the way people can apply network definitions. Uh, there's a company over in, um, in, in Amsterdam that basically um, builds clouds for customers 
underlay, I mean, Arista switches with a cloud stack implementation in 15 minutes. Like, you can't have the go to the network people and wait two months for that change, right? Like, the bills of the world won't, the company that, like, lets Bill still put his foot down about it has to, you know, this is the way it is. Sorry. Um, I, and the other thing I want to make sure is I'm not trivializing the importance of network definitions in the bills of the world. Like, I make fun of Bob's and I make fun of Bill's, but the truth is, Bob has a very important job. And Bill has a very important job. Bill has to protect that network and the health. So again, that's the scenes that play out. How we get Bill to think differently, how Bill gets hit with these convergent points that where he's going to have to adopt, who are the people that try to help him. And only for the people that are DevOps folks out there, like the network people have asked me to come help and they want your help. Like they know we've seen this movie. And so if you're listening to this, you're excited, go talk to your network people and tell them that, hey, I'm not telling you how to change things, you know, because I, you're the expert, but I want to help you figure out how to adapt to this new world so our company can be, you know, agile and effective and you know, work with the speed that, say, a Netflix or a Netflix obviously uses public cloud. But. Right. And so getting the network there, bringing DevOps to the network, what are the driving factors? What do you see as the, the key turning points? Like you mentioned the cloud earlier with compute. What do you see as the key turning points? So, I, you know, I think, you know, I think the, the, you know, the true conversion, things like OpenStack and cloud, like pu private cloud, right? Private cloud is, is forcing kind of old field to, you know, to green field implementations where they just can't tolerate those kind of wait times for delivery, right? And, and the other thing too is scale, right? So I think, um, you know, an old model of how you do things might work even at massive scale. Like I work with a company, you know, 35,000 devices, right? Network devices, right? Um, they're actually going to try to consolidate down to about 20 or 40 top of rack switches for their complete new implementation. So going from say 50,000 bare metal servers, uh, non-virtualized to um, 5,000 servers, with 1.5 million virtual instances, right? In a new network architecture that's going to be basically kind of lease line, they were looking at Arista. Like in that world, when you start looking at that level of scale, you, you better be smart enough to know up front that the way you do things, like you have to take a hard look at like how do we do things today at like, you know, at this scale, and when we get to this scale, what is going to be the optics of us if we don't change? And I think the smart companies are seeing that kind of, oh, we cannot, we cannot exist without automation. And it's the same thing that happened in public cloud and, and cloud implementations. Smart companies realized, you know, early days trying to sell Chef and Puppet to people were like, eh. But when they started seeing this explosion of scale, you know, when a, when a media company knew that they could, for an election, spin up more instances than their full server farm in less than a week, it scared the hell out of them to realize we can't do things the old way. So I always give long answers, but the, long, the, the, the short answer is scale is, you know, people who understand that you have to operate differently at scale um, and particularly are concerned about the OPEX cost of doing it the old way are going to have to adopt automation styles that we've seen the patterns work in a similar way with compute. And shifting gears just a little bit, you've been doing a lot of research in the networking space. What have you learned in your journey, and were there any surprises? Um, yeah, I know. It's, yes, I mean, I think what was you know, so you know, I always joke, you know, I go up in front of a crowd, especially when I'm taking speaking to like a crowd of like Cisco CSCIDs and all that. I'm not a network guy, you know, like so, like let's let you know, don't, don't think you're going to beat me up on network stuff, right? Let's put this out of the way, but. Um, but the thing is, you know, so I, I knew enough about the network beforehand, before cloud came along, right? We all kind of dropped off our resume networking stuff once, you know, the cloud was there because we didn't think it was as important anymore. But uh, then we come to find it's actually incredibly important. So I, it's not like I, I didn't know anything about the network, but when I went back and I started going back and looking at all the router protocol stuff, it was interesting, um, it, to me it's an interesting what's going on in SDN. You have you have sort of um, you know, a software-based SDN, which would be a VMware implementation. If you've heard of Martin Casado, he was the inventor of OpenFlow Pure, almost software. And then you've got to know what Cisco's doing. And it's interesting that if you look at um, the old router protocols, you know, in some ways the, the hardened network people would say there was nothing wrong with the router protocols except we did a bad job of building abstraction layers for them. And then some of the new people are like, we're just going to do it completely different. So it's been fun to watch a little bit of the debate 
of really what is, if you understand SDN as a control plane, data plane, there's this debate of, and learning more about how important and how interesting things like OSPF and VGP, and you know, coming into it early, I would think, oh, it's pure software, I'm a software guy, this is gonna make all the sense. You know, software-defined networking, of course, what, what, what VMware, what Nasira did, you know, now NSX, is total winner, right? And to actually step back and really understand the depth of, of just network protocols. And again, that's part of how we win and change in hearts and minds, right? So if we know how to go back and say, you know what? Like, I'm not naive to think this can be a complete software solve problem. And in fact, incidentally, some of the companies that have been running, like Nasira's original for three years, were basically doing it pure software, are now having them kind of at scale move back some things like put um, router protocols in the top racks, which is because of tendency and scale. So again, I, to me, that was uh, to learning, I knew I was gonna learn a lot about the network, but to learn kind of the, the, the real brain of a network person, and it starts with the brilliance of these router protocols, because they are brilliant. And I joked that uh, like in, it had to be born in 1940, to be able to build a new router protocol, right? It's, it's <laughs> computer scientists that, with the, before computer science was built, like you had to be born then to become the first computer scientist. So. And so, just in general, what are you finding interesting these days? What people, projects are you tracking? Okay, there I say it. You know, the, everybody dr take a drink, get a drink out. What am I going to say? Docker. Um, it, it's real. It, it is absolutely. I mean, again, I tend to, you know, people call me the squirrel guy, right? Like, squirrel, squirrel, you know. But, like, like Docker, I mean, I'm, all of us have been following it for quite a while, but it, you know, you know, I always say when I have these debate, like, is Docker just kind of another fad, or, and I, I think about like, um, I think about um, Amazon, right? So I mean, people will say that the cloud's been around forever, right? And yeah, that's right. I mean, yes. I, I mean, I worked on mainframes, you know, so I'm a pretty old guy, right? I, I worked on you know true IBM mainframes, and yes, we did have kind of cloud-like infrastructure and virtualization in some of our mainframes, but. I will not take any credit. I mean, the credit goes to Amazon for putting a stake in the ground, for creating this consumable, just so everybody can actually use. You know, I work with Gene Kim a lot, right? And, and we, we talk about the unicorns and the horses. So Amazon made it so the horses could use consumable public a cloud infrastructure. Um, so containers have been around forever. Right? First, our containers have been around forever, you know, Docker, blah, blah, blah. But, but what the Docker people did is they put a stake in the ground, and they, you know, just to put it short and sweet, they made it so the horses, not just the unicorns, could use containers. And the way they did it in terms of how they did it with the uh, hot file systems, you know, using ButterFS, building images, shareable artifacts, using kind of a workflow, very similar to Git, um, I, it, that's their brilliance, right? And, and, the, and we can see there's a reason why. I mean, I, I tell people that I think that Docker is lingua franca in web scale right now, right? Like, and so yes, it's a fad, but but when you start like thinking about what it can do for our industry, and we start going greenfield to move away from fat virtualization and framework based, dare I say it to piss off all my OpenStack beloved friends, but but fat framework based cloud infrastructure to like really lightweight, you know, containers and you know, just hosting containers, and if you watch what Google's been doing for three to five years. It just makes all the sense in the world. So I think Docker, now for me, interesting enough, is the intersection between network and Docker. It's, that's the most exciting thing for me right now, is how to do some of the really interesting stuff that's been done with Open Daylight, um, and that stuff for like OpenStack, how can we move that into, you know, kind of a, instead of a hypervisor-based, a Docker host-based, in general, container-based, host -based, but how can you take things like OpenFlow and OpenV switch and make that apply uh, aggressively to a world where I think a lot of people are going to be running containers as opposed to virtualization. There I said it. <laughs> Thank you very much for talking with me sure. today. Sure.